Chapter Three of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. As Joseph grew older, he loved to be alone. He was still lively, ready for a romp, rushing headlong into trouble. But there was another side to his nature which demanded that he spend much time thinking and considering. This need for solitary hours made him ready and willing to take over a job heartily disliked by his brothers, that of tending his father's sheep. He got the nickname, The Little Shepherd. You must be as stupid as the sheep are to want to be with them so much, his friends taunted. I don't think sheep are stupid, grinned Joseph. They do what they are created to do. They eat and grow wool for us and become mutton for us, and they don't talk to me all the time. I like sheep. He turned a cartwheel, leaped over the stone water trowel in the stable yard, and ran off to the hillside with his untalkative charges. For some time he just sat and watched and chewed on the stem of grass he had plucked. But wearying of the inactivity, he began playing a game he had invented. He picked a field flower and waved it before the nose of a nearby lamb. The little creature stretched out to bite the flower and Joseph moved back. The lamb took a step forward and Joseph moved back again with a knock-kneed baby lunging after him. Sometimes, when the lamb felt frisky and was enjoying the game, it lasted for a quarter of an hour. Then the little creature would be rewarded with a prize morsel. This time, though Joseph was unaware of it, he had an observer. The lamb's mother, a cranky old ewe, watched what seemed to her to be unkindness to her baby. She'd put a stop to that. Head down, she charged Joseph, her sharp little hooves cutting into the turf a hard skull ready for the impact. Unconscious of what was in store for him, Joseph leaned over to surrender the flower to the lamb, which was tiring of the game. He presented a perfect target for the angry, fast-traveling ewe, and before he knew it he was sailing through the air, then rolling head over heels down the hillside. He lay there stunned for a moment. Then he carefully got to his feet and walked slowly and painfully back to join his flock. He stood for the rest of that day. Sheep certainly are not stupid, he said to himself, and I guess that's the end of that game. Joseph finished with the elementary school in Worcester when he was thirteen. This meant, according to the custom of his day, that he was through with schooling. His two older brothers, Leonce and Gerard, were already doing men's work on their father's farm, and now Joseph was ready to join them and do his part too. Plowing, harrowing, seeding, cultivating, harvesting, Joseph did them all with a boundless enthusiasm he brought to everything, whether work or play. Nothing seemed hard or distasteful to him. No obstacle could thwart him. Whether it was a stump to be grubbed up, a bulky cow to be milked, or a hard-packed field to be plowed, he would stay doggedly at the job until he had completed it. The outdoor work certainly seemed to agree with him. He shot up in height. In no time at all, he was seven inches taller than the aunts, his eldest brother. But he was no beanpole. He gained in width and in strength, too. On market days, when Mr. de Wooster was going into town with his grain, Joseph would swing the 200-pound sacks onto the wagon as if they had no weight at all. That Joseph, Mr. de Wooster would say with paternal wonder and pride, that boy is as strong and as smart as four ordinary boys. Look at him herd those cows. You'd think they understood every word he said. And his barns, so clean and sweet, a person wouldn't be ashamed to live in them. Whatever he does, he does well. He'll make a great farmer. He has a way with animals. Joseph's way with animals was called into use before long. Not far from the DeVooster home, there lived an old woman alone in the world. She owned her little house, a few acres of land, and a cow, which provided all her food, except what bits kind neighbors could tactfully get her to accept. When Mrs. DeVooster baked, she always put in an extra loaf, which she would then send over with the message that she was oversupplied and hoped the neighbor would help eat the surplus. One evening, when Joseph went on some such errand, he found the old woman in the shed with her precious cow. The animal was on its side, gasping, and its owner was crying bitterly. Joseph was dismayed at the scene. This cow is very sick, he said. Shall I run for the veterinary? He's been here and gone, sobbed the woman. He says that he can do nothing to help my poor cow, that she's going to die. Joseph knew that the impoverished old woman would never recover from such a loss. He must do something to help before it was too late. Carefully he looked over the suffering animal. Don't let's give up hope, he said encouragingly to the woman. Go into the house and boil up these herbs. 
he named the ones he wanted, and bring the mixture out to me. Bring any cloths you can spare, too. Hot poultices on the outside, and frequent drinks of the herb medicine may help. The woman hurried to do her young friend's bidding, and was very quickly back with the requested supplies. You go to bed now, said Joseph kindly. You can be of no more help here while I'm working. Through the long hours of the night, Joseph tended the suffering animal, forcing doses of the herbs down her throat and changing the hot packs on her distended body. Get well, good cow, he urged. You know that your owner depends on you for milk and cheese. She accepts from you what she couldn't or wouldn't take from us. Get well, good cow. Praying, doctoring, nursing, cajoling, Joseph poured out all his energy on the task in hand. The moon rose, crossed the heavens, and sank. Grey dawn came. A rooster challenged the sun to rise. The cow, still lying on her side, gave a great sigh, and Joseph's heart sank. Had he lost his long fight? He looked at the sick animal sadly, then with joy. The creature was slowly getting to her knees, then to her feet. Thanks be to God. Joseph was near to tears as the cow moved over to the hay rack in the corner of her shed, pulled out a few wisps, and began munching on them. The DeVooster family had shrunk in the past few years. Eugenie, who became a nun, had died at Uden. August was in the novitiate of the Sacred Hearts Fathers at Louvain. Pauline, always closest and dearest to Joseph, had entered the Ursuline Order. Mr. DeVooster now decided that he could run the farm with the help of the two older boys, Leonce and Gerard. Joseph, he determined, should become a grain merchant, and to prepare for this business career would need more schooling. So in 1858, at the age of 18, Joseph entered the school of brain le comte He was big and awkward, and his education had stopped when he was 13, but his good nature, strength, and athletic skill made him popular with the other students, while his determination to learn endeared him to his teachers. With the same wholehearted enthusiasm he had brought to the farm work, Joseph attacked his schoolwork. He read and studied with a concentration that amazed his fellow students. He played vigorously, too. Then, at night, after a strenuous day, he would lie awake, praying with the same fervor. For Joseph had already decided that he was going to give his life to God. He was trying to think of a way to break the news to his father and mother. He realized that it would mean hardship for them. They had already given three children to God's service. Now they were undergoing the expense of giving Joseph extra schooling, so that he could take his place in the business world to help his father. We can understand why he found it very hard to tell these generous parents that their plan for him could not be carried out. End of chapter 3 Recording by Maria Therese